July 1861, the Civil War. Soldiers lay under heavy blankets and try to sleep as cannon fire keeps them awake. They cradle their rifles in their tired arms. One soldier can't sleep and finds a quiet place to write. His courage has kept him alive so far. But his memories of his wife have kept him calm. In the dark, he writes what will become his last letter home. What did he have to say? How did he resist his desire to leave the war and return to Rhode Island? Find out. Read the letter, My Very Dear Wife, by Sullivan Ballou. July 14, 1861, Washington, D.C. My very dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. Lest I should not be able to write you again, I feel impelled to write lines that may fall under your eye when I shall be no more. In this first paragraph, he is saying he's an army soldier. And when he says, I think we're going to move in a few days, He's not talking about, oh, you uh, know, we're moving to a new house, we're moving to a new neighborhood. His troops are going to move into battle. And he says, he's, I'm worried that I may not be able to write to you again, so I'm going to write right now. I feel compelled to write now, and that what I write might be something that you will not see until I am no more. When you get this letter, I may be dead. All right, he's going into battle. Our movement may be one of a few durations and full of pleasure, and it may be one of severe conflict and death to me. Now here he speaks directly to God. He says, not my will, this isn't what I want. I'm not worried about what I want. I'm worried about what God wants. Not my will, not my desire, but thy will, O God, be done. If it is necessary that I should fall on the battlefield from any country, I'm ready. Falling on the battlefield means dying. I'm ready to die for my country. I have no misgivings about it or lack of confidence in the cause in which I'm engaged, which this was the Civil War. He's fighting the for the defense of the U.S. government. Uh, he says, my courage does not halt. It does not falter. So I'm not afraid to go into battle for my country. I know how strongly American civilization now leans upon the triumph of government and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the American Revolution, the fight to create this government. And I'm willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys, to lay down my life, to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. It says we fought a revolution to create the American government. And now that it's under attack from within, that's what the Civil War was, uh, he says, I'm willing to fight and pay the ultimate price, his life, to defend the government. He says, but he knows there's a, a consequence and that his family, his wife, that they suffer. He says, but my dear wife, when I know that with my own joys, I laid down nearly all of yours and replaced them in this life with cares and sorrows. It says, you know, this sacrifice I'm willing to make has a consequence to you that you now are going to have a life of sorrow because I've died. And then he says this, after having eaten for long years the bitter fruit of an orphanage myself, he grew up without a father. And he's, he's, he's worried about the fact that now he has to, will end up doing that for his own children. I must offer it as their only sustenance. He's making an analogy of, you know, of the bitterness of having no father as being a food, the bitter fruit of orphanage. And now he's giving that bitter fruit to his own children. Um, so he says, it's weak or dishonorable. It says, but the, the banner of my purpose floats calmly and proudly in the breeze. My unbounded love for you, my darling wife and children, 
should struggle in fierce though useless contest with the love of country. He says, it's, it's not a fair fight. Um, I have to fight for my country and it's unfair to y'all that you have to suffer because of my devotion to my country. So that's the way it is. I love you and I love my country. And you know, he, he basically has to choose and he's choosing to fight for his country. Paragraph four, I can't describe to you my feelings on this calm summer night when 2000 men are sleeping around me, many of them enjoying perhaps before that of death. And again, this, who knows how many are going to die in battle. He says, I am communing with God, my country and you. He is suspicious that death is creeping behind him, that death is approaching. And so on this calm night, he's thinking about his God, he's thinking about his country, and he's thinking about his family. Paragraph five. I have sought most closely and diligently, and often in my breast, for a wrong motive in thus hazarding the happiness of those I loved, and I could not find one. He's looking, he's analyzing himself. He says, why am I doing this? Is there some selfish motive going on? Is there some, am I doing this for any wrong reason? He says, I can't find one. My motivation is a pure love of my country and of the principles I have often, often advocated before the people and the name of honor that I love more than I fear death have called upon me and I have obeyed. He says, I'm doing this because I love my country and because I'm an honorable person. Paragraph six. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me to you with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence, omnipotence is all powerful, that means God, nothing but God could break this bind, bound, this uh, bond between us. Yet my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly on with all these chains to the battlefield. It says nothing's going to break the bond between us, and yet I, I still have to go into battle. The memories of the blissful moments, that means happy, the happy moments I've spent with you come creeping over me. I feel most gratified to God and to you that I have enjoyed them for so long. I'm glad we've had this relationship. And as hard as it is for me to give them up and burn the ashes, the hopes of future, and burn to ashes the hopes of future years, when God willing, we might still have lived and loved together and seen our sons grow up to honorable manhood around us. He says, you know, our plan was to grow old together and watch the kids grow up. But now I'm in this battle. I'm fighting for our country. It may not happen. I know, but few and small claims upon divine providence. That means fate. But something whispers to me. Perhaps it is the wafted prayer of my little Edgar that I shall return to my loved ones unharmed. If I do not, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I love you. And when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it will whisper your name. He, he's saying you know, there's a degree of fate involved here. And, you know, he's going to go into battle. What's supposed to happen is going to happen. And he would love it if he'd make it back home. He says, but if I don't, don't forget that I love you. And that my last breath, I'll be whispering your name. And knowing that this is, possibly his last communication with her. He says in paragraph eight, forgive my many faults and the many pains that have caused you. How thoughtless and foolish I have oft times been. How gladly I would wash out with my tears every little spot upon your happiness and struggle with all the misfortune of this world to shield you and my children from harm. But I cannot. I must watch you from the spirit land, from the spirit world and hover near you his spirit, while you buffet the storms with your little precious freight, with your precious little freight, and wait with sadness till we meet to part no more. Um, again, he's thinking about himself being dead, and that she, like a boat, has to fight the storms now by herself, and the freight, what she's carrying, is their children. You've got to get through life with our kids, and just wait until we both have died. And then we'll be together again in the afterlife. 
And he says, but Sarah, if the dead can come back to the earth and flit around unseen those they loved, I shall always be near you in the garish day and in the darkest night. Amid your happiest scenes and gloomiest hours, always, always I'll be there. And if there be a soft breeze upon your cheek, it's just my breath. Or if the cool air throbs your throbbing temples on a bad day, that's my spirit passing by. So Sarah, do not mourn me when I'm dead. Just think that I'm gone. I'm waiting for you. Now we shall meet again. As for my little boys, they will grow up just as I have done without a father's love and without a father's care. Little Willie is too young to remember me. And my blue-eyed Edgar, he will keep my frolics with him among the dimmest memories of his childhood. Sarah, I have complete unlimited confidence in your maternal, your ability, your motherly care and your development of their characters. You'll raise them well. Tell my two mothers, his and hers, I call God's blessings upon them. Oh, Sarah, I wait for you there. Come to me and lead thither my children. At that last part, you know, again, he's talking about if I'm dead. You know, I'll be waiting for you in heaven, and you come to me, and when the time comes, you bring the children as well. All right, answer your questions and do a great job.